Warning, this video covers quite a few sensitive topics, which may be traumatizing to certain viewers. Even if the incidents involve fictional characters, the situations may be all too real for some. If you feel uncomfortable at any point, stop watching immediately. And as I have been unable to add proper skip segments throughout the video, feel free to skip this one altogether. I have talked in the past about how comic book characters have been around for a long time with different people adding their own spin to them over the years. A problem that can arise due to this is a lot of the older material is lost to the sands of time. Sure, if you're a well-known character heavily tied into the company's image, your older stories are very likely to be circulated and if you're about to get an adaptation, well, look whose trades are about to get reprinted. But reading these stories much later after they were printed can rob them of the context in which they were originally published. Or worse, after all these years, the various arcs and character moments might end up blending together, leading to them being forgotten. And this is something that can happen to the most popular characters. For example, the Wayne Family Adventures version of Batman feels like a breath of fresh air due to his characterization as a caring father figure to the rest of the Bat Family. However, this isn't new at all. Bruce Wayne has always been shown to care deeply for his protégés. But hey, let's take a few stories where he's shown to be callous, mix it up with a few out-of-context panels, and Batman now fits perfectly into the stereotypical badass role who is always right but treats everyone around him like crap. So, imagine if this can happen to Batman, arguably the most well-recognized hero on the planet, what chance does someone like poor Mary Marvel have? Shazam. Since a lot of superheroes have similar types of story arcs, they end up being defining by a single memorable moment. And because they are heroes, these moments are not usually flattering. And that's basically the premise of this video. There are a lot more examples than the four highlighted here. So sound off in the comments down below about which characters you think are defined by their screw-ups. Or even better, if you have any examples of a character being primarily defined by something positive, let me know and we'll compare notes. Anyway, let's get started with... While Wanda uttering no more mutants is probably her most well-remembered moment, sadly, it's a more of a trickle-down effect of several things happening to her for decades. I talked about it a bit in my video on her relationship with the Vision, so I'm only going to talk about the most significant issue plaguing Wanda in relation to this video, her kids. Wanda and Vision had two kids named Billy and Tommy, and for their conception all the way to House of M, they would end up casting a huge shadow on Wanda. So, to keep myself from derailing, as there are many plots here worthy of dissection at some point, I will now go into summary mode. If you think I missed something, well, comment down below and tell me, but in all likelihood, I just skipped over it for the time being. The kids would turn out to be not real at all and end up absorbed by the villain Mr. Pandemonium. The shock of this would cause Wanda to become catatonic and then temporarily go insane. Not the last time this would happen. She would recover and a spell was cast to make her forget her kids. Unfortunately, the Wasp, Janet Van Dyne, who is coming up later, would slip up and remind her of her kids. Need clarification if this was a retcon or not. She would then again go insane, kill a bunch of Avengers, create the House of M reality, and then utter those three fatal words. No. More. Mutants. However, things would get better for her after this, relatively speaking. While hated by most mutants, arguably for good reason, she would eventually return to being a hero and an Avenger. The miniseries The Children's Crusade, while being an extremely flawed comic, 
did manage to somewhat clear her name, while also confirming that the young Avengers Speed and Wiccan were in fact Wanda's kids in a way. She would even get her own solo series developing her, written by James Robinson. I haven't read it myself, but people tell me it's good, so good for her. Unfortunately, when the MCU came knocking with their own version of the Scarlet Witch, they would end up adapting the only two things most publicly known about her, her relationship with Vision and her insanity when it came to her kids. These and everyone tell her that they don't really exist Fantastic. and then her just go nuts, that would be unbelievable, but I don't think they're going to do that. <laughs> I have not seen any of the Disney Plus shows, but due to the trickle-down effect of pop culture, I know the basic plot of WandaVision, which seems to have adapted a version of the Vision and the Scarlet Witch comic, but with elements of House of M. And I have seen Doctor Strange 2, in which... She is the main villain with a goal of finding her kids in the multiverse. Yes, she is influenced by the Darkhold, and... The movie ends with her realizing her mistake and dying, stopping to its corrupting influence. But, it is telling that the most relevant plot for a character that has existed since 1964 is one that is about her going insane in regards to her kids. Well, that's enough about the Avengers Resident Mage. Now let's take a look at what baggage the Justice League's backward speaking magician is saddled with. This is an interesting example of how the effects of an entire storyline somehow ended up pinning the blame of everything negative on a single individual. So back in the Bronze Age, there was a story arc in the Justice League of America title where an iteration of the Secret Society of Supervillains would end up switching bodies with several members of the Justice League. While the heroes won, a question was raised in retrospect. Wouldn't they have looked? And thus began the Mind Wipe storyline, where it was revealed that seven members of the League Green Arrow, Black Canary, Hal Jordan, Hawkman, The Atom, Zatanna, and Barry Allen were working in secret to keep their identities secure, i.e. whenever a villain found out who they were under the mask, they would hunt them down and make them forget. These revelations would paint the League in a negative light, but somehow the Leaguer who had to take the full brunt of the negative impact was the hero who had to do the mind wipes in the first place, Zatanna. The stories which explored the impact of the mind wipes did try to portray her as someone who was more than okay doing the League's dirty work, with some subtle hints thrown in that she was doing it because she had lost her own mother. But something needs to be taken into account here. At the time of her joining the League, she was a rookie, who had suddenly been given the greatest honor imaginable at the time, membership in the Justice League, an impressionable young hero given the responsibility of protecting everyone's secret, combined with the loss of her own parents? Why wouldn't she have said yes? Hal Jordan, who despite being written at times like stubbornness and willpower are essentially the same thing, even brings this up at one point. But I haven't talked about the worst part of all this. Now, the only reason we would even consider mind wiping to be a gray area was because it was being done to unrepentant criminals who, if they found out the hero's secrets, wouldn't think twice before hitting them where it hurt the most. However, one day they decided to go beyond that. The criminal Dr. Light had attempted to rape the wife of the elongated man, Sue Dibney, and the seven heroes voted to fix his personality. While this was bad enough on the part of the heroes, Batman would end up walking in on them trying to do it. 
and was also mind wiped as a result. And since Zatanna was the one who had done the deed, over time, she became the sole bearer of the blame. The Adam would disappear from the books for a while after Identity Crisis. Hal, Black Canary, and Green Arrow would get a pass because they regretted their actions on panel. Barry was dead at the time, and Hawkman... Yeah, I don't know why Hawkman doesn't get more flack for his role in all of this. He's the one who pushes to lobotomize Dr. Light and mind why Batman. He is the only one to show no regrets for his action. He even tries to victim blame Batman, who very satisfyingly decks him. And he gets a pass somehow? Zatanna would be stuck with the tag of Mind Wiper or Miss Mind Wipe for a long time. Her relationship with Batman would be strained as a result of her actions, and whenever these incidents were brought up again, she would be written as someone who took an almost sadistic glee in wiping people's memories. She's not blameless in all this, mind you, but did her reputation deserve this level of tarring and feathering? Thankfully, the New 52 would successfully wipe the stain for her reputation. <sighs> If only all stains could be removed this easily. Before we begin, once again I feel obligated to put a content warning as I'll be talking about some very heavy stuff. So, that Oliver Queen, eh? Man just can't keep it in his pants, can he? Why does Black Canary, aka Dinah Lance, still date this guy? It's almost as if they had a really solid relationship before some questionable writing choices tore them apart. The Mike Grell penned Green Arrow stories, especially the Longbow Hunters, are considered a highlight when it comes to Oliver Queen stories. But lately, they have earned a reputation for being a bit too much on the unnecessarily dark side. And it isn't a completely undeserved one. However, the violence isn't the main issue related to this video. It's the fact that Oliver cheated on Dinah with Shado and they had a kid together. Since then, Ollie has been written as a horn dog who would chase any tale that would give him any attention. The wife of one of his teammates, the niece of one of his colleagues. Let's just say Ollie kept shooting arrows till his quiver ran dry. Except, let's go back to the original incident and see what actually took place. Oliver had been injured and was on drugs during his encounter with Shado, and could in no way consent to having sex. Yeah, the whole Ollie is a man ho reputation comes from the fact that he was raped by Shado. However, Ollie isn't completely blameless. In regards to cheating on Dinah, Shado took advantage of his helpless state, and there's no ambiguity there. But in a moment of weakness, Ollie made out with a girl employed at Dinah's flower shop, which led to the two of them breaking up. And with the magic of the passage of time, people have somehow combined the two events together. This isn't helped by how comics tend to treat the topic of male characters being sexually assaulted, where male characters are still treated at best as enjoying the experience or worst as perpetrators. Don't believe me? Almost 19 years after this incident in a tie-in to Blackest Night, this incident with Shado is referred again, showing that Ollie was just as into it. Yeah, it was probably meant to mess with the character's head, but dear lord, the panels do not help. And that's how an entire aspect of Green Arrow's character was added because Shado took advantage of him to sire a child. And somehow this isn't the worst example. Once again, last warning, turn back now if you feel uncomfortable. 
Well, if we are to talk about the most infamous moment in Hank Pym's life, we need to establish some background, namely his relationship with his then-wife Janet Van Dyne, and of all things, the Marvel method. So, once again, going into summary mode to check off the relevant points, because if we don't, I will cry. Big manly tears, but cry nonetheless. Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne would become Ant-Man and the Wasp when Hank's first wife and Jan's father were killed. The relationship between the two was complicated from the get-go, with Jan reminding Hank of his wife because the two looked alike, which is kind of funny considering how comic book characters tend to be drawn. Of course, from Jan's perspective, the situation was quite different. Jan was quite younger than Hank. Besides being her mentor slash partner, she also had a crush on him. Given that her father had passed away, I don't think it's that much of a stretch that Hank was also sort of a father figure as well to her. Uh, man. Hank's behavior towards the relationship would also vary from issue to issue. And this is where we have to get a bit technical as I need to explain the Marvel method. For a long time at Marvel, this is how the books tended to be written. The writer slash plotter would give an outline of the story to the artist who would then draw the story but keep the word villains empty. And then the dialogue would be filled out by either the original writer or someone specializing in writing dialogue. Now, this distribution of work was only theoretical, as more often than not, the first writer would only give a page or even a single line, which the artist would then have to interpret and essentially come up with the story as they were drawing it. Not that they got a lot of credit for it, but that's a topic for another day. Let's just say Stan Lee was very similar to Walt Disney in more ways than one. Naturally, character consistency was something of a rarity if you weren't that important a character. So you would get pages where Hank is worried sick about Jen, while also getting gems like... Henry Pym, you're beginning to sound like a stuffy old bachelor again. And I intend to remain that way. Now see if you can't be quiet long enough for me to activate the double catapult. Anyway, Hank's mixed feelings aside, we need to next talk about the Yellow Jacket incident. A new hero called Yellow Jacket shows up claiming to have killed Hank Pym. He then demands to join the Avengers and marry Jan, who decides to go along with it. And then surprise! Yellow Jacket was Hank Pym all along. He was going through a mental breakdown where he imagined himself as a completely different person and Jan took advantage of that to marry him. And they stay married. And the Avengers don't do anything throughout all of this. Worst teammates ever. So, all of this now culminates into the infamous Avengers 2 and 3. Hank Pym is about to be kicked off the Avengers due to his reckless behavior and has come up with a plan. He will create an adamantium robot that only he could disable. Jan, seeing what he did, tries to reason with her, and then he hits her. Yeah, this is a dark moment, something that will resonate badly with a lot of people in the real world, regardless of the superhero trappings. Except, it wasn't supposed to be that way. Three decades later, Jim Shooter, who partially wrote the storyline, would explain that his script had Hank go through a mental breakdown where he would accidentally hit Jan while wildly flailing his arms about. The artist of the issue, Bob Hall, however, decided to go for the most extreme possible action he could think of, and we end up with one of the worst moments in comic history as a result. Unfortunately, this explanation should have been delivered a bit sooner as within 30 years, no matter what Marvel tried to do, Hank Pym would be remembered for slapping his wife and creating Ultron. And let's just say a lot more people were willing to forgive him for the creation of a genocidal robot. 
This wasn't helped by the alternate universe series, The Ultimates, which would take it one step further and turn Hank into a full-on wife-beating domestic abuser. My god, The Ultimates has aged like milk. I could bring up how it wasn't really Hank's fault. I could bring up the fact that Jan had forgiven him and the two even dated for a bit. I could bring up all the good that Hank has done, but would it matter? A poignant scene with regards to the Hank Pym incident comes from Secret Empire of all places. So at that moment in time, Hank was fused with Ultron and was hosting a dinner party with the various members of the Avengers who were on two opposite sides due to stupid reasons. When Pymtron brings up that they don't do this anymore, Iron Man, who is an AI of Tony Stark at this point, just go with it, brings up they stop doing them because Hank hit Jan. Pimtron gets mad and starts pointing out all the crap the various Avengers sitting around the table have pulled, especially Tony Stark, whose actions during Civil War and the incursions were honestly worse than what Pim did during a mental breakdown where he wasn't in full control of his faculties. But the reason, in my opinion, obviously, why Tony Stark remains a hero to millions and Hank Pym isn't, it's quite simple, actually. Tony's crimes are not something a lot of people would encounter in their daily lives. But Hank's are just a little too close to home to be swept under the rug. So yeah, I guess we know that Hawkman is a dick who everyone gives a pass and the Avengers will not do anything to help you if something goes wrong in your personal life. Also, Hank Pym is currently dead in the main Marvel Universe. I guess he got what he deserved.